So I'm, I, I guess I, my aim is to try to contribute to that by raising a cluster of issues which are related. So it's not, I don't know whether it's a kind of narrative, more than sort of a, some things to put on the table to inform that kind of, that kind of discussion. So let's, uh, let's see, see where we go when we're finished. Okay. okay, so it's one of the things that I think it's really important to say, although hopefully most of the people in this room are on board with this already, is that um, often ethics gets a bit of a bad rap in this kind of situation, this kind of discussion. So ethics is often reviewed, often seen as something that's against research. It's about trying to stop research, as we said earlier. Ethics is something you get through, you get over, you get past, and then you can get on with whatever it is that you're going to do. Uh, and ethics is often seen as something which is overly concerned with regulation, with control. Um, and that's a misconception, I think, of... Uh, it's a misconception of how it is, but it's also not how it ought to be. Um, there are strong ethical reasons. Well, firstly, one thing is I think once you've got your ethics approval, that's actually when the interesting ethical issues start to reveal themselves. So that's, that's one way in which it's wrong. But the other is that there are really strong and important ethical reasons in favour of arguments in favour of medical research. You know, this, this, is, this is an important enterprise and it's important for moral reasons. At the very, at the very least, saving lives, reducing suffering, etc. These are ethically important considerations. So ethics is not in, inherently against medical research. In fact, the default position it ought to be that it's in favour of medical research. So what I want to do against that kind of background is say a few things about the ways in which I think medicine is changing in the light or, or perhaps some of the aspects of medicine which are being made more visible by things like uh, personalised medicine but also the range of activities that are needed to support personalised medicine. So the first, and I'm sure Barbara would have said something about this at the beginning of the day as well, is that it becomes increasingly apparent, apparent that medicine is a shared collective project. It's a project in which even if we're interested only in our own healthcare, we ought to be concerned about the collective aspects of medicine. The best care for individuals is increasingly going to, be involve, going to involve comparing one person's data with other people's data. And what that means is we're going to have to create and maintain a high quality, very large clinical data set, which is refreshed over time. And that's a collective action problem if ever there was one. So it may not be in any individual person's benefit at this moment for that data set to exist or for their data to be in it. But nonetheless, it's in the interest of all of us that that, that, that data set exists. Not simply for altruistic reasons, because even if we're interested only in our own care and getting the best care that we can in the future, that, that this, this is going to be the clinical tool for it. This is no longer only about research. This is about clinical care. So. All for one and one for all, or one for all and all for one, whichever way around you put it, that seems like quite an interesting motto for this, for this kind of activity. And there's another way of aspect to this, which I just was thinking about on the way down. One way of thinking about this is that there's an, the, one way of seeing this is that this is a kind of public health activity, which is, I think, quite interesting. So one aspect, one way in which medicine's changing, this is the kind of the infrastructure that makes personalised medicine possible. One thing that we need to recognise is that this is a increasingly a collective project, even though it's about individuals. Secondly, it's going to increasingly require a, the coming together of clinical practice and medical research. So we, we're moving towards a world in which medicine is a clinical research hybrid. The utility of that data set, it's not just enough to put the data in there. Research work needs to be done on that data set for it to be a useful tool. And this requires the formation new formations of collaborative partnerships, different kinds of institutions, different kinds of people working together. It's going to include increasingly, even if we think about this as being about the NHS, for example, increasingly this is going to be work that has to work internationally. It's going to be bringing together research groups, health services around the world to work together to enhance these, these data sets. And whether we like it or not, this is also going to be an activity which has to involve industry, technology and commercial partnerships. So that, that if, if we think this is true and this is important, that raises a, uh, a whole range of different kinds of ethical problems to the ones we're used to. So the old problems of, the old ethical problems in healthcare don't disappear, but new ones emerge. And one of the ones I think that's gonna be most important is if we see this as essential, how are we gonna understand the nature of those relationships, the kinds of obligations, the kinds of responsibilities that are generated through those activities and through those partnerships? So one example might be 
is it the case that we have to start to think about researchers or people managing data sets or, or uh, computational biologists? Are these people who start to have something that looks a bit like a duty of care to patients or a bit like a duty of care to the health service? Are these effectively starting to look like health professionals, for example? So that's, it seems to me those are interesting questions that we haven't really addressed and we're going to have to address. And it's odd because I'm talking about personalised medicine, but I'm also talking about health systems and social activities. But I think these two things are inseparable. And that's, the, I guess, the point of my presentation. Implicit in everything I've said is that data sharing is going to be a key aspect of this. Even if we think about clinical care as opposed to research, we tend to think about data sharing as being about sharing data with researchers. But even if we're interested in the development and maintain, maintenance and improvement of this as a clinical tool, data sharing is going to be essential. It's a key requirement for precision medicine, both for clinical care and for research. And one of the questions there is, it, well, there are a number of ethical questions, but one question is how much, so if we accept that data sharing and the use of data are key for the best medicine, we might still take the view that with privacy and security are so important that actually we'd be willing to give up a bit of that medicine. We, you know, we, we might be willing to accept less perfect medicine than there might otherwise be. But, or we might be willing, so the one question I think we need to answer for ourselves is how much are we willing to pay for the security of data? And so part of that is gonna be money. But you probably, you may have heard this morning from Tom Fowler about the 100,000 Genomes Project approach to this. So the 100,000 Genomes Project, I think, is unique in many ways. But one of the ways it's unique is that it's very committed to data sharing. But the way it does that is it, it's got a secure environment. Researchers have to come into that environment to use the data. Their activity is going to be observed, audited, and overseen. So they can be checked. So you come in and you, and you say you're going to do research on X. Uh, if you don't do research on X, that becomes apparent. And you, and every data that ha you can't pay, take patient data out. What you can take out, take out are the results of your analysis. But that could be overseen and checked. That seems like every time you mention that to participants or to the wider public, that seems very reassuring. People seem to okay, I, I'm happy with that. I, I I can see that. But that is hugely expensive and hugely technically complicated. And it also, to some extent, re restricts the kinds of research activities that you can undertake. So. I think there's a genuinely genuine decision to be made here about, about there's a trade-off between security um, and, and, and potentially benefit. Issues related to governance, issues related to equitable data sharing and so on. Sorry, speaking a little bit quick, I'm sorry about that. I'm just trying to save a little bit of time for, for discussion. Feedback of findings, you've probably heard about already today, so I won't say much about this, but if you, once you go down the road of thinking about healthcare as a clinical research hybrid, this means feedback. The whole point of the activity is to feedback and inform, inform care. And so that, that raises a whole range of issues, even if you're just thinking about, so you might want to separate out feedback that relates to the condition the person has. They present with breast cancer, for example, or, and other kinds of stuff you might find. But even if you're interested just in the, in the condition that they, they present with, there are a whole range of questions about stuff that you could find which is of different degrees of certainty and relevance. So how do we decide what we're going to feed back? And that's not, of course, only related to the individual person. So caring for, one of the issues that I think arise out of precision medicine, interestingly, is to what extent do we have obligations to, to families, to family members? So one of the things that geneticists will say if they're in a the room, one of the things that Annika Lukasson would say, for example, is Precision medicine often requires you to look at family pedigrees. Even, so you get your genetic data, you get the best data you can, but you still need to look at family history to make a decision about what's relevant to that patient. So to what extent does thinking about, does family thinking, uh, is it, to what extent is that a necessary requirement for precision medicine in some cases? So that works that way. And then the other way around is when you find stuff that's relevant for family members, what are your obligations to those family members? Particularly given that they're all going to be in your data set or many of them are going to be. So there are ways in which potentially that you could, you, could, you could think about them. All of this um, means that the new, the new world we're living in, the new health system, the new set of, the way, new way we think about medicine is going to be, is going to require us as professionals and patients to live with un, new forms of uncertainty. It's tempting to think that we might get more certain over time and uncertainty might disappear, but that seems highly unlikely. It seems to be, it's going to be an enduring characteristic of this way of doing medicine. So there's uncertainty about what's going to be found and when. Um, there's uncertainty about what kind of research might be done on the data in the future and by whom. 
and any findings that are given back to people, any decisions that are made are always going to be potentially revisable. So this is, but this is the future of good clinical medicine. So this is not something I think that can be avoided. So when we're thinking about the ethics of this in the future, we're going to have to think about what, how can we do ethics in a way which is capable of taking account of very large uh, degrees of uncertainty, open-endedness, and, um, and statistic, statistical nature of those findings. So what, that raises a whole range of problems for the ways in which we've historically done ethics. And I've mentioned some of them already, but one of the places it puts lots of pressure, I think, is in this traditional reliance we've had on consent. We've certainly since Nuremberg, but, uh, and also because of commitments to patient-centered medicine, we've, we've tended, whether explicitly or implicitly, to think that consent can do all the work of ethics. So if you've got really good consent, then whatever it is you're going to do is ethical, with some marginal cases around that. That just doesn't seem like it's going to do the job here. And I think that's a healthy thing, because I don't think it ever did the job, really. But I think it's, it, it certainly makes that visible and puts pressure on it. So one question is, one question would be to say, does, does the presence of this kind of openness and uncertainty mean that good, con good quality consent is impossible? I don't think that's the case. But I do think that very specific, detailed consent is, that's just not going to work here. Um, for reasons that are obvious, so I won't spend time uh, dwelling on that. Broader, broader approaches to consent are perfectly capable of being valid and being justifiable, and uh, Mark will, may talk about that later. But it's so I'm very committed to the idea of broad consent. I think it's really important. But even if you do really good, really well, well done broad consent, in this kind of world, consent can't do all the work for it that you that you, that you need it to do. And one way of getting at that might be to ask a question, uh, something like this. Let's just if we assume that perfect, uh, that perfect consent, so perfect knowledge about the future and so on is impossible, what other kind of protections need to be in place to ensure that people who participate in research are, don't, aren't subjected to um, unnecessary harms or discrimination and so on? And I think that's a really interesting question because it opens up questions about equity, about justice, about uh, discrimination and so on. And those are questions which are tendency to focus on consent historically that they've been masked to some extent by that and I think one of the problems with focusing too much on consent is that it can't do the work required but another reason that focusing on consent is a problem is because it masks all these other social considerations justice considerations and it also masks the fact that medicine has always been a social collective enterprise okay so th we've got I my point here I suppose is to say that Precision medicine is one element in, in an emer emerging new form of medicine which presents a whole range of interesting problems, which of course I can't go into in 20 minutes. But I'm, es I'm es essentially saying that I think there's a bit of a paradigm shift here that we need to take account of. Medicine as a shared project, medicine as a clinical research hybrid, medicine as something which is, which is driven by data sharing, by feedback, medicine which is characterized by openness and uncertainty which is not gonna go away and medicine which recognizes that consent is not ethics. The way I've tended to think about this is that this is, turns medical ethics, at least to some extent, into, a, into a, 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 a question about political philosophy to some extent. Medicine is changing. There are strong arguments in favor of these kinds of medicine. I think it, we, we'd be hard pressed to come up with good reasons to give up the, the potential here. But take, thinking about the, of the future of this and all the activities I've talked about, public trust and confidence are no longer something that it's nice to have. It's essential for these. So the 100,000 Genomes Project, for example, has got samples from 100,000, well, it's sequenced 100,000 sample, samples and got samples from about 80,000 patients. But what's behind the scenes there is that those people have given consent to access to their medical records for their life and even after their death. Uh, so these are li living, refreshing data sources, and that's the whole point. So, so they, at any point they could say, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, the future of that kind of medicine, the future of the kind of health service I'm describing, depends crucially on public trust and confidence that's sustainable. And I think that requires us to rethink the relationship between, or at least to explicitly think about the relationship between science, medical science and society and healthcare practice, and actually to work towards 
something that I've called here as a new social contract. We might call it a, a, a something else or might be more informally thought of as a, a set, a sh some kind of agreement about what it's reasonable for people to expect. And on the other side, some sense of what medical scientists and medical practitioners can feel is it's reasonable for them to, to do to, so they, they know how to proceed. And I, I think that's a question which has a sort of political dimension to it. Um, Okay, and of course my final point is to say that we can only really achieve this if we embed ethics into medicine. And just to give you a case study, in the winter, in the winter between 2012 and 2013, two major initiatives were launched in the UK. It's often not realised that they were launched at exactly the same time. Both of them planned to share anonymised data for research with, in the public interest. In both cases, data would be used by researchers and by commercial companies. One of those initiatives was care.data and the other was Genomics England. Genomics England celebrated its 100,000 sequences uh, yesterday. We, I don't know what's happening to care.data, but I think there are a range of differences, but one of the differences is the ethical con consideration reflection was built into Genomics England from, from the outset.